Welcome back to Room Packs Reza Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Dustin Ramsdale. This podcast series features a variety of topics of interest to hired professionals who work in and with and around college and university housing. Uh, so this is another episode in our ongoing series this season, uh, talking to the current blogging team for Room Pack. They cycle through a lot of great people, uh, bringing in perspectives on a variety of topics. So uh, as we did uh, in I think right about this time last year, uh, we were talking with all the bloggers. So uh, we will start out as we always do. Uh, Natasha, if you want to introduce yourself and your professional background, and then we will uh, go from there. Yeah. Well, hello. It's great to meet you. My name is Natasha Monteith. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a current third-year graduate PhD student at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro in the Educational Research Methodology Program with a focus in program evaluation which is a whole lot of fancy stuff to say, I really like assessment and evaluation and I want to do it for forever. Um, A little bit about me. I'm originally from Michigan, went to Central Michigan University where I was an RA and really involved in first generation college access programs. I actually proposed a first generation living learning community as my capstone honors project before graduating. And then I moved on to Boston College where I did my graduate degree, the first one, uh, in higher education administration. And I served as a graduate resident director there where I got my first exposures to assessment. I did a junior year student needs assessment and I worked on a late night programming model and explored whether or not the late night programming model actually impacted alcohol intake over the course of time. Really cool stuff, fell in love with it. Moved on to Georgia Southern where I was a resident director for two years. Then I moved to UNCG during the pandemic it was a time um, and got to work there for a little shy of two years before moving to a remote L&D role because I realized I could not do the PhD program and an entry level housing position at the same time. Um, so I'm very lucky. I'm now doing my PhD full program full time. I have a graduate assistantship where I'm getting to work with evaluation work in the K-12 setting and also in the academic side of higher education. So excited and happy to be talking about the student affairs side for a little bit. Yeah. And I think there's certainly will be, I think some kind of uh, cross pollination or applicability around just sort of like higher at large, but yeah, focusing majority of our conversation around uh, assessment in uh, student affairs in particular. So, um, you know, we might kind of use interchangeable terms here, but I know that's yeah, kind of your background, your interest. And uh, it is kind of funny that I think most of the folks on the vlogging teams here, like we have a current master student and like folks in uh, PhD programs and stuff. So I think it just, uh, you know, we can talk more about that, I guess, of like uh, what attracted you to writing, you know, uh, at this time. But it seems like at least when you're like consuming all of this content and classes and stuff is a good way to kind of uh, get it out and everything. But uh you know, to kind of start from a common base of understanding, you know, assessment, I think is one of those terms. Certainly right now, I feel like the one is like digital transformation. I've just realized that like, there isn't like a common definition of that assessment. I think we've got a little bit more clear on uh, collectively uh, as a field, but um, so I don't know if it's like your definition or a more like textbook one, but how would you define assessment in student affairs in particular? I'm going to jump on a soapbox real quick. We're literally less than three minutes in and I'm already going to jump on one. But um, I think in student affairs, what we refer to as assessment, the remainder of professional, pause, restart. (laughs) So I think something to start off with is thinking that in student affairs, we call this work assessment. In almost every other field, it is called evaluation. So if I'm talking and I use the word evaluation, it means student affairs assessment. Um, But usually when people hear assessment outside of student affairs, they are thinking the GRE, the SAT, language assessment, um, a lot of standardized measures is what assessment means outside of student affairs. Um, But inside, I think of it as action and use-based research practices without the intention of publishing. So there's this guy named Michael Quinn Patton who basically founded this idea of use-based evaluation, that if you're going to take the time to explore a program, understand what it's doing, understand how to make it better, you need to be thinking about how you're going to use that as you're going. And I think right now, student affairs assessment is really situated in that type 
of evaluation approach. Um, but that is something I'll talk a little bit about later probably, is that if you're looking for resources, don't look up assessment, look up evaluation, and you're going to find so much more that's relevant and helpful for what you're trying to do. Yeah, that's a good kind of uh, bit of advice there to kind of expand, because I think that's the idea is that like student affairs assessment just over the like, I mean, I've worked professionally in higher education and a lot of it in sort of student support and everything for uh, nearly 10 years. And I feel like it's student affairs assessment is like its own little sort of like pocket community that, you know, is existing within like within sort of the broader evaluation, like education evaluation probably community. So if it's like, if you feel like you're not being well served by kind of this, the nascent kind of uh, folks who kind of use that terminology and everything, it's because it is sort of, I don't know, I'm sure the people who like prefer that term or whatever, like have a good reason for it, but um, that's certainly good where you can kind of expand your horizon to get a lot more uh, insight and everything. Cause uh, yeah, I mean that, that idea of, you know, in higher education, you're, you know, offering resources, doing programming or a variety of different things you want to know, you know, how much is it being used by whom, what do they think of it, you know, and how can we uh, adapt and evolve what we're doing. Um, and I, I would even think just with some conversations I'm having, like figure out what maybe we need to like start or stop uh, doing because it's just not, you know, serving our constituents well, uh, you know, as institutions kind of evolve and having residential students, hybrid students, commuter students, and online students, all these sort of, you know, things and adult learners. So um, yeah, I mean, if over the past 10 years, I feel like this work has, you know, evolved and gotten more of a light sh shown on it, I feel like the importance uh, has only heightened, but from your point of view, like what makes this such an important practice uh, in student affairs right now? Yeah, I think first is is funding. Like right now, we are seeing enrollments drop across campuses. We are seeing state budgets get cut. We are seeing federal budgets get cut. Money is harder and harder to come by. And when you have good data to back up why you deserve the money you're asking for, that you've got a better argument. <laughs> um, and so getting to be able to go up and advocate at a state level, at a federal level, you need to be able to tell that story in a language that transcends the campus. Because what's happening on college campuses is amazing. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that, so I'm, I'm based in North Carolina, the folks in Raleigh might not know what's happening on a college campus and might not be able to understand the story if you're not talking to them in data. Um, outside of that, I also think assessment practices and evaluation practices let you tell your story, but also your student's story. So I think about it from a recruitment standpoint, that if you have really solid qualitative stories you can pull out and talk about, that's helpful from a recruitment standpoint. So if there's fewer people who are going into college, if you can go ahead and sell why your campus has a better experience or a different experience or might be serving the experience that student wants, awesome. Um, thinking about data-backed decision-making, this is a big, big area of interest for me. So my, my research interest is in data literacy. So like how well do folks actually understand data and can use it to make decisions? Um, I think that we need to have a like really look at what does data literacy look like in student affairs? P.S. If you're watching this, please don't start researching that yet. You're going to take my dissertation. But um, I think that is a big conversation because we keep talking about how important it is to make data back decisions, but we really haven't asked ourselves, are we in a place to be making data back decisions? Um, and you already kind of mentioned this a little bit too, like program improvement, making sure that what we're offering is actually going to do what we say it's going to do. Are students learning the things we say they're doing, going to be learning in these experiences? What is the impact after an experience? So you spend $15,000 on an amazing retreat. What is the impact of that a year later? Obviously, there's all sorts of things that are going to end up making that really hard to look at on a one-to-one -one scale, but thinking about the impact of these really unique experiences that are being offered. And I think something else that's a big, kind of a big movement that's happening in student affairs assessment right now is also thinking about equity-based assessment. And so thinking about who are things working for, who aren't they working for and why. Um, there's some really great evaluators who have been looking at this since the 70s and have kind of created, it's called the culturally responsive and equitable evaluation approach. And they offer some really helpful frameworks to think about 
how are we building programs that are actually going to assist the folks that we're trying to build them to assist? Um, so I think overall, like the reason you do assessment is to try to make the thing the best it can be and to be able to make an argument for why it should stay. Yeah. I mean, those are really powerful points. And I think there's just so many nuances to, to each of them where like, you know, it is for like your own sake, again, for like what you're doing to keep doing it and doing it better and to kind of serve your own uh, office and uh, all of that. But like, like you said on like the funding piece, it's like, that's obviously for sort of self-sufficiency of just like, you know, keep getting funding for what you're doing, but then like holistic for the institution, they can keep getting the funding for uh, the organization at large. But I was even thinking like, for like alumni, you know, if they're either they donated to something, they want to know what's happening with it, or if they know that they're engaging in an organization that has a culture of sort of transparency and effectiveness and all of that, like they're going to know like, yeah, if I'm chipping in for this new center for academic success, like, you know, this is a place that cares about results, measures them, shares them uh, and all that. And I think that that's, you know, just continue to be like a, a new area to kind of try to tap to get uh, support for new endeavors and uh, all of that. So I think, yeah, it's like the work that you do serves the, like evaluating the work that you're doing serves the work that you're doing, but also can like serve so many other stakeholders and constituents and, you know, other purposes where, like you said, it's like a prospective student, you know, your institutional leaders, your, you know, for accreditation and all these other things. So it's like baking in that, that culture and trying to do it effectively and efficient, efficiently. Cause I think that's like part of like where my mind goes to of like, you know, and obviously folks like you like writing on this and thinking about it a lot. It's just like the, the act of doing the evaluating is like, well, how do we do that effectively? Cause I think like most people would understand it's like, Oh yeah, this is important. I get it. You know? And, but they may not be going about it in a way that feels like uh, efficient or uh, effective and everything. So I think that's why it's like, an area where I feel like there's always a, a good opportunity for discourse and show and tell and all that, because like, that's, I imagine, and I'll sort of present this to you, I guess, like, you know, where a lot of people sort of like groan when they sort of like hear this topic or something is because it feels like it's a sort of like tedious or sort of kind of agonizing process to go through it. But I feel like it's because maybe they're just not going about it in the most effective way. That's like the biggest point of feedback I've, heard every time I do student affairs assessment work is this is one more thing. Like student affairs folks are busy. And so I, I think it's one of the biggest places we still have to grow is like you said, like, how do we bake this in? Like, how do we make this be something that is so, so ingrained in what we do and how we do it, that it's not this other survey we have to make. It's not this other focus group we have to do because we've already built it into the plan from the get go. Um, so again, I'll throw out to Michael Quinn Patton, the whole premise of use-based evaluation is you are thinking about how you're going to use it from the get-go. And that allows you to think about every step along the way. How are you going to look at what you're already doing and just add in assessment moments or evaluation moments throughout it? So you already, let's say you're running a residential curriculum, Right. Um, I'm going to shout out to Erin McFerrin, who works at Georgia Southern University. She used to have us do an end of the year reflection time called My Hall Story. And it was a beautiful moment of assessment because it was a time that was already baked into our curriculum. We were all going to do it. And what we all did was have students come out and basically gave feedback to Housing and Residence Life about like what was the most impactful moment you had in the last year? What is something we could be doing better? And it wasn't, it wasn't something that ended up being this big, oh my gosh, I need to make this survey. I have to do all this stuff. It was already prepared for us. There was one year we did postcards, I remember. They were already like printed out for us. We just had to take them and do them. Um, and so I think about things like that, where if you're working in housing and residence life, how can you build these things in where the students might not even realize they're being a part of this? because it just feels so natural. Um, and there's still a place. There's this place for sky factor surveys. There's a place for these big, large scale. We're going to take this and be able to compare from campus to campus. There's a place for that. And there's so much room for us to go ahead 
and collect really meaningful data in our day to day that lets us make everything better as we're growing. I'm curious, I guess, how you view digital tools playing into this, because I think that's probably a, a place where there's been sort of an ascendancy of appetite, familiarity, and prevalence of uh, various digital tools that can help serve that idea of like baking in day to day, the ability to like, you know, uh, track how students are using a resource or to solicit feedback or, you know, do those comparisons and stuff. Do you have any point of view on that? I guess of just sort of like how digital tools play into this whole equation. Yeah. I mean, I think room packed, obviously I'm a little biased right now. I write for them. We're on their podcast. Uh, but I think they have a lot of really cool and special tools that you can use. Right. So I think using what's already, if you already have the, have the platform, use it. Um, other things that I think I've been really, really surprised and happy to see is like you have Qualtrics, right? Which you can do some really cool survey stuff, quantitative. There have been some really amazing qualitative tools that have been coming out. So I love, it's called atlas.ti. And it is a space where you could pull up all of your qualitative data and you can code it in there. You can theme it in there. You can theme it across all of these different platforms. And you can make some really, really impactful like patterns pop up that you might not see otherwise. So you have, let's go ahead and say you have a form in Room Pact that's open to students at all points in time. And they are always welcome to drop in whatever feedback it is that they have. Y'all go this is really awesome. We have this. We're going to review it once a month because that's, you work in housing and residence life. That's how much time you have. You can do this once a month and give it actual time. Every month you take that feedback and you upload it into Atlas TI and code it. So that way it's there. You don't have to come back to it, but maybe at the end of every semester, you are able to look at that whole code book and see what's come up multiple times across multiple people. It helps you realize like this is what's important to our students and it's maybe not just a one-off comment. We actually saw this come up 10 times. Maybe this is something we need to put our time and energy towards to try to fix or try to address. Um, so I think a lot of it, I think a lot of a lot of campuses have gotten really good at at baking it in. It's just they haven't gotten to the point where they know how to do something with the data they have. Like like folks drown in data. There is so much data in student affairs, especially in university housing, but it's what do you do with it? And so I think I think it's it's a both and situation. Realize where you've already probably baked it in without realizing you baked it in. Highlight it. Now figure out how are you going to analyze it? How are you going to make meaning of it? And what are you going to do with it? Um, so I think it's finding tools that also help you make meaning. So I'm a big fan of Qualtrics big fan of Atlas TI. And I think both of them also have a really, really great security platform. So like, I get really nervous about like, please don't, please don't put your stuff up on Google Docs. Like don't, don't house your data in Google Suite. Don't do it, please. Like, please put it on a secure server. <laughs> so both of those have really secure servers uh, that make sure you're following ethics. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, and that's like a good point because like part of sort of elevating your work and just good advice, which is kind of what uh, kind of segueing to next. It's like, you know, students do that, like just it's human nature is like in a vacuum, like we will some way, somehow figure out a solution to what our problem is. So like students, you know, often like if they're registering for classes or something, just like go to their, you know, roommate or their floor mate or their friend or whatever. And like asking about like, how to register, what to register for, and all those sort of things. And so they're just doing that in a vacuum if they can't find the resources they need. And that's sort of the idea of like, if somebody's like, oh, we need to like get feedback or do this, the, the other thing. It's like, I don't know how to best do this. I'll just make a Google form or whatever, you know, and just do that. But it's like, when hopefully someone knows better, they will do better. And I think just knowing that uh, it should not be a long-term solution to gathering uh you know, student input and feedback and everything. So um, are there other bits of advice if it's just tools, tips, tricks, strategy, whatever kind of comes to mind, whatever you're willing to share? Uh, what advice do you have for folks trying to improve their assessment efforts? I'm a big fan of backward design when it comes to assessment. 
um, thinking about what do you want to know by the end? Like setting really solid, good questions from the get go and having your plan of regardless of what the answers are, how are you going to share that at the end? Because I think that's sometimes what I see happen is Departments will go through large scale data collection, get all this information from students, from faculty, from other staff. And then the things come forward that maybe they don't like. And therefore that report doesn't go to everybody, which I can understand. Evaluation and assessment are very political activities. However, I think we need to have, have a bit of a, a moment of realizing that like, it's going to be okay if we also say share, like we're not, always going to be the best. Like if we're striving for continuous improvement, there has to be things we need to improve on. And it's okay to say we need to improve on them, especially if we can provide a plan of this is how we're going to do it. So I think planning how you're going to share your information from the beginning is really helpful. And it also allows you to have a level of accountability to everybody. um, So that way you can't kind of backtrack on that. Or if you do, it becomes a little bit a little bit more sticky, but having a plan of this is how we're going to share our information from the get go. And then I've got a, I think one of the big pieces is realizing that if you're looking for tools, don't, as I said before, don't search for assessment tools because you're going to just find a ton of stuff about language assessment. It's, it's just everywhere. Um, so searching for program evaluation, you're going to find tools and things that are going to be a lot more helpful for you than if you're just looking up assessment, especially if you're trying to kind of self-teach. Um, one of my favorite books that I tell folks, if they're just kind of starting this out and they're not really sure what in the world folks are even saying. So like, you've been listening to this podcast and you're like, they keep, she keeps saying qual, she keeps saying quant. People keep telling me formative, summative. It's okay. We all got to start somewhere. If you're at that kind of phase, um, Zena O'Leary has a book called The Essential Guide to Doing Your Research Project. And it's literally a step by step. Like, let me talk you through this as if we're friends. Let me help you through how to do this guide on how to do a research project, which it's not going to be as intense. You can pick and choose which parts you participate in because you're not doing research. You're not going to be publishing what you're finding more than likely. But the tools in it are really, really helpful. Um, Some other ones. So there's a book by Fennell and Rogers. I think it's called Purposeful Purposeful Program Theory. Um, So if you're somebody who's more like, I really love student development theory. Like if you are one of my development theory friends and you want to understand the theory behind evaluation and assessment, super helpful book. As somebody who has always liked assessment and evaluation, but has struggled so much in understanding why do we do it this way? Like, help me understand why do we decide to ask these questions the way we're asking them? Like, why why is it important that I put demographics at the front compared to at the back? Um, Fennell and Rogers, phenomenal. They also go through a thing called a logic model, which is something I would say if you are listening and you are a director level, look into logic models and thinking about making a logic model for your department. Um, It's basically a visualization of what you do, what you have, and where in the world are you going? And it helps you stay on track. Um, So I could go on to this for forever, but I'm going to stop there for right now. (laughs) Um, So lots of really good tools. I'll send you a list. What I would recommend is like quintessential reading lists uh, of things that are helpful But I think if there's one skill that I'd tell folks like, hey, it'd be really helpful to like hone in here, it's making your assessment plan. And that assessment plan is going to include that sharing plan as well. It'll include how are you going to analyze the data when you get it? Um, Because you should be thinking about that as you're building up however you're going to collect data. Also have a question mark of like, should you be collecting data? Again, you're probably drowning in it. Do you need to make another survey? Or do you already have something that's really, really close to what you need? You probably don't need that other survey. You probably have something you could use. <laughs> well, and that makes me, again, the sort of like, you know, do you necessarily need to add a new thing to your plate? Or can you even like subtract? Is it like, okay, maybe we're surveying too much. We're not getting enough response or getting detailed responses. And like, 
something is sort of the last point then we'll kind of get to just sort of our final couple questions is like a quick follow-up because like the idea of being so kind of data rich but not kind of analyzing it and getting insights from it you know i think is absolutely the case so then like uh if the majority of what you're relying on, like, I think it absolutely needs to be part of the mix, but if you're over-reliant on like self-served survey responses, like my point of view is like, you need that input and feedback, but being overly reliant on that, a lot of people will often say what they think you want to hear, or they'll say one thing and actually do another. So sometimes you do need to actually like look at, you know, how's the resource being utilized with the activity in this, you know, digital platform or something like kind of make sure that that's in the mix because that's a bit more telling of like what people are actually doing or not doing than what they claim when they're responding to a survey. And that that can also be, you know, again, like a low response rate versus, you know, if it's like, okay, this is like a platform all of our residential students should be using, um, you know, and you can kind of, get your arms around things in a more comprehensive sense. So I'm um, curious your perspective on that, of like how you sort of try to have a mix of kind of modalities of which you're soliciting data. Yeah. I mean, literally I'm, I'm giggling to myself a little bit because this is what we're covering right now in my survey class of like when you're acting, asking for factual data versus opinion-based data. And if you're asking for factual data, is there a different way to do that? Um, so kind of what you were talking about, it's looking at like how many people are actually coming in. Something I really enjoyed doing when I was still working in housing was I don't want to take a guess at like what policies we might need to educate folks around. I'm going to go pull the incident reports that have come through in my building in the last three months and see like what sanction, like what did I charge these folks with in, we had used Maxient, but it's like, what did we charge these folks with? because that's what we need to be talking to people about. Obviously there's a gap here of some kind, whether it's folks don't know the policy exists or maybe people are making some decisions and maybe we need to do some alcohol education. Like you've got information right in front of you that you don't need to send a survey about. You already got it. Um, One of the assistant directors I worked with at UNCG, Chris Gregory, um, during the COVID pandemic had done some really cool information, like like following tap access records to see like in the middle of this pandemic, are students moving around as much? Like, is this potentially why we aren't seeing folks like in the hallways? Like are folks even leaving the buildings and coming back? Are there certain times of the day that we're seeing higher traffic and not seeing higher traffic? Um, So I think finding factual data spots is really helpful. I think unfortunately so much of our stuff right now is built more for that opinion-based piece. Um, There's some really cool research out there right now in in industrial organizational psychology saying that like folks, self-reporting is actually really, really close to the true value if it was like reviewed by a supervisor. Do I think that's going to necessarily transition down to an 18 year old on a college campus who's never been away from home before? I don't know. but there's some really interesting conversations about like are self-reported measures valid and reliable? Um, and the, some of the research right now is saying like, yes, it actually is, uh, which I think might also flip a lot of our understanding on its head. I remember when I was reading it, I was like, this, this feels odd and takes everything I know and has me think about it in new ways. So I'm interested to see how that continues kind of, as they continue exploring that area. Yeah, I mean, that's helpful just, yeah, again, to to reinforce that it has its place when done well for the right information. Like, it can be very truthful and relevant and useful. Um, And yeah, there can be different dynamics of like, how are you asking a question? When are you asking it? And then like, you know, uh, yeah, that idea of like, I'm sure it would be maybe a little bit underreported if you're asking a bunch of 18 year olds, like, Hey, do you drink? How much do you drink all the time? And it's like, you're probably going to like underreport it. Be like, I don't know, maybe a little bit sometimes or something versus like being exactly it. Or like, I can imagine sometimes like asking, and again, this could be relevant if that's what you're looking for, but like overconfidence maybe about like, you know, comfort with technology or different things where it's like, Hey, well, these are tools that you've ever actually used before. So you've said that like, Oh, I, I, you know, and learn new technology tools really easy, but then you're actually seeing that like, wow, help desk tickets from first year students have been spiking about like, you know, and that would be like interesting things where it's like, 
that again could be the insight is that like, well, students come in a little overconfident. So we do need to try to address that. Um, but then that idea that like students might underreport their drinking and it's like the incident cases are like higher than they've ever been for alcohol consumption or possession or whatever. So it's like, you know, these people say that they like barely ever drink or whatever, but like the incidents say otherwise, but it could also be where it's like, well, actually not that many people do drink and it is just like a few people keep getting cut. Like they will not like, you know, get the message here. So yeah, I mean, that you have to try to like, I think have that sort of, you know, di- diverse mosaic of data. Cause I think if you were completely reliant on incidents or completely reliant on opinions and self-serve surveys or whatever, like, um, you might not be like completely missing the mark, but it can help you get like that much closer to sort of the, you know, kind of the bullseye there. So, um, yeah, I was just curious your, your perspectives on that. Yeah. You're good. I, and what you just said, like sparked something that I'm like, Oh, I wanted to bring this up today. Um, because I think, I think you're right, right? Like folks are going to give different answers depending on who they're talking to. And something I I have not seen yet, and I, I, hope, I hope there's a department out there doing this, something I think would be really, really helpful is if folks, if a department decides they're going to do some kind of qualitative, um, qualitative data collection, whether that's a focus group or an interview, I think it'd be really impactful to hire in undergraduate research assistants. Like the impact of having somebody who's maybe in their junior year who has like gone through your background checks, has all that done, um, doing interviews with your residents, you're going to get a different level of, I, in my opinion, transparency than if it's somebody like me who far removed, like viewed potentially as an authority figure, you're going to get different information. Um, and it, that kind of like falls back into this idea of like culturally responsive and equitable evaluation. There's this idea of, um, oh, cultural guides. That's what they're called. Um, so in this framework, there's this idea of cultural guides who are people you hire to help you navigate the culture of the folks you're trying to understand. Because you can acknowledge I'm not a part of that group. And therefore, if I come in, I'm inherently changing the dynamic and I'm not going to get the best data possible. So let me hire in somebody from that group, pay them for their labor and get information that's going to help us make better decisions. Uh, That's something I've like had as like a, just a chat with way too many student affairs folks. I'm like, I don't see why we're not doing this. Uh, I'm sure there's a reason, but if there isn't, I hope somebody can take that and run with it. Cause I think you'll get a lot of really cool, like very, very vulnerable information when you let students talk to each other. Yeah. A well-trained, uh, prepared peer. I think yeah, I could get some really amazing insights. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, this is a question that we ask uh, all of our blogging team because I think, you know, it could be kind of just interesting ways that folks have kind of uh, found their way to the team this year. So uh, what attracted you to writing for Loom Pact? Yeah. So I uh, told Paul in my interview, I was like, I am trying to get into the habit of writing before this dissertation hits. And I am now forced to get into the habit of writing. (laughs) Like that was one of my big pushes of those. Like I was looking for something like this already. However, I got really excited when Room Pack posted because I'm not in a higher education or student affairs grad program. Like I... I I weasel it in to a lot of my classwork because I'm passionate about it and I know I want to eventually come back. But I hadn't really had the opportunity to draw those explicit connections. Um, So being able every month to sit down and say like, this is the stuff I've been learning for the last three years. Let me apply it to the field I love. And let me give folks what I hope are really, really helpful, like step-by-step. This is how you do it. This is what it looks like. Like, let me give you tools that you can come back to year after year. Um, Like I think about, I was really happy to be able to do that training assessment uh, series. That's the word I'm looking for. So I was really happy to do that training assessment series because I thought it'd be really helpful for folks to even send that to somebody during onboarding. Like, so you just got added on to the student staff training committee. Hey, we're going to send you this. This is how we think about assessment in here. 
this is a part of your onboarding now. Uh, my hope was to have it be something that outlasts me a bit and that people can hopefully continue to find value in. Uh, but I tried really hard to not get caught up with language stuff. I think there's a lot of resources out there that can help out with like qualitative versus quantitative, summative versus formative. Like there's folks who already are doing that. There's not a lot out there that really shows you how to in a housing context. Yeah. I mean, I think that's always like a, a downside of content nowadays is I think like everybody wants to be like the thought leader. So I think like as much as you can get into like, here are tactics and that uh, sometimes can just, you know, set a little bit of like an expiration date on certain things, but like uh, a good piece of content is going to have a pretty good shelf life because like, even if it's like not modern right up to the millisecond, it's like, Oh, I could, you know, this was like from this time, but I can sort of take inspiration from what they were doing and all that. That's why I feel like certain textbooks just kind of have like a really good um, longevity and everything. So um, yeah, I mean, there, there's, I think I'm just seeing more people like creating podcasts or writing or doing different things where it's like, we're getting into just like tangible, specific, relevant tactics for doing specific work because you know, at a certain point, it's like we have enough people just sort of like espousing, you know, thought leadership and all that, like that always is going to have its place. But uh, it's refreshing to see that folks are like committing themselves to getting uh, yeah, just really tactical. So appreciate you uh, uh, doing your part there on the assessment front. But um, so final question here, uh, as the sort of eternal optimist, always like to talk about, you know, what folks are looking forward to in their work. Certainly, you know, you're in your program and You've you know, got all that writing and stuff uh, ahead of you and everything. But uh, yeah, what are you looking forward to right now? Yeah, I think so right now I'm kind of like in the mix of realizing that the classwork in my program is wrapping up real soon. Um, and I'm I'm getting really excited to move back into student affairs, like started to poke around, maybe apply to a job here and there. Um, but I'm I'm really, really hopeful right now that Hopefully a year from nine, right now I can say like, oh no, I'm a student affairs assessment practitioner. Like that's what I'm doing. Um, and like, I'm, I'm, I'm over the moon about my research too. Like I, I just within the like last two weeks finally found the like tool I've been looking for, for the last two years, somebody finally wrote a test and I was like, beautiful. I don't need to make a test now. Um, so I am really, really excited to dive into my research. Like I, I am patiently counting down till January when I will only be working on my proposal and hopefully starting data collection next May. So I am, I'm just so ready. I feel like I'm like a track person who's like at the beginning where you're up against the blocks and you're like, okay, just, just blow the whistle. Let me go. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Cause yeah, I mean, it's like you as someone, I guess, you know, for that metaphor, like, you know, who's going to do this like huge marathon race. It's like, yeah, they're doing a lot of like exercise and prep and training and all that. Like that's part of the deal is like kind of the process leading up to this, like one big moment and everything. And uh, that idea of like a doctoral program being this big commitment and everything, but it's so different from, you know, a lot of other academic uh, endeavors that people go on because it's like, it, it is so hyper-focused on what you're interested in and want to explore and all that. So um yeah, really excited for you to to begin this journey soon and, and for us to all see uh, what becomes of it and just appreciate your time on this episode and being a part of the blogging team at RoomPact and uh, for you sharing all your insights uh, on the blog and here. Uh, so um, we'll have ways to connect with the resources that you mentioned and to connect with you uh, to keep the conversation going. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much. And I genuinely, anybody who has questions, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to chat. Um, and best of luck with everybody's assessment efforts.